All right, so what is new in Precise since uh, the past year? And before the past year, let's look at uh, an overview of what has happened in the past many years. Many of you may have read uh, the original Precise version 1 paper in 2016. And back then, Precise was a library that was working mostly in C++ in Fortran with some Python bindings that are completely different from what we have today. And there were also some adapter prototypes. There were users around the world that were um, early adopters and had already added the library to their codes. This includes codes such as the foam FSI that someone asked me about uh, yesterday and more. Um, between 2017 2018, it's uh, uh, the beginning of essentially the, the current uh, generation uh, when me, Benny and Frederick started and uh, David was already involved uh, uh, by his bachelor's thesis. And uh, there we started getting more adapters. Some of them had already been prototypes and then we uh, started making them uh, more involved. And um, later on, uh, we also got more people joining and we had uh, our first tutorials and a web-based tutorial that I don't know who of you has actually tried on run.precise.org. We also had some uh, first approach to testing everything together with Travis CI that unfortunately kind of got phased out by itself eventually. We are working on um, better alternatives. And then we had um, many new, new codes and bindings. Uh, we have nowadays uh, language bindings for MATLAB. We have uh, examples in Phoenix, DL2 and Nutils that are all finite element frameworks. And uh, people have worked on MBDyna and LSDyna. There was also the config visualizer that uh, we used yesterday. And uh, in the middle of uh, 2020, we had uh, Precise version 2. And the version 2 means that it's a breaking release. And we had um, significant changes both in the configuration and in the, uh, in the functions you can call in the API. We had a detailed uh, upgrade guide that told you what exactly you need to do. And that's what uh, we are working on for version 3 that uh, will uh, come probably later in the year. And that's what Frederick will talk about tomorrow. Um, we got a new website that um, seems to be quite useful. And we restructured the tutorials in a way that you can also more easily contribute. And we also created this uh, virtual machine that some of you used yesterday. Later on, we got uh, bindings for Julia that are being further developed till today. And uh, more and more codes are being added. You see that I talked about the precise library and I talked about many other components. So today we don't only have a library that you have to be a developer to use in your code, but uh, we have already multiple other components that make it easy for you as an end user to, to start sketching up a simulation. So that's something quite important for us and the particular focus of uh, my uh, work here, how to make things easy for non-developers. As an example, to run a case that depends on OpenFoam and maybe Phoenix, you need uh, the library to work in both C++ and Python. In C++, it is already written. In Python, you want uh, to have an interface between C++ and, uh, C++ and Python. This is the Python bindings. Then um, you also have adapters for both OpenFoam and Phoenix. And then you can combine them into some simulation cases, and we have, for example, a tutorial for a flow over a heated plate. Further downstream, uh, all tutorials 
you can uh, run directly in the virtual machine. So we have all the software stack that for us is also an ecosystem. This is the, the precise ecosystem that includes the core library and much more. I like to see this as, a, as an onion with multiple layers. Of course, the, the more layers you peel, sometimes the more you cry. But uh, you see that every layer also has multiple of these components. Apart from what I mentioned here, we also have um, many uh, continuous integration uh, tools. And we also have automated builds of our website, of how we render the documentation, and so on. Let's now focus as a first step in the precise library. And uh, later on, I will talk about the, the rest of the ecosystem, the, the flesh, if I may say. And uh, later on, uh, about news from the community. I have uh, excluded many technical details that are happening under the hood. And I know that uh, Frederick would really like to talk about them. But I know that also most of you are new users, so I will try to keep it minimal. Something that you already used yesterday uh, is the precise tools. And in particular, you used uh, the check option to check your configuration file before running your simulation. This is particularly interesting if you cannot start a very large simulation just to, to test your configuration, right? And uh, this is now integrated into something that before was shipped with Precise, but was not really useful at all, at least for a while. It was called Bin Precise. In the past, this had completely different um, roles. But uh, nowadays, we are uh, reviving it, and this will have more features uh, soon. Something else that is useful is that you can get your uh, precise version without having to first uh, start a simulation to see what it links to. Let's see just an example of this. If you have a configuration file and you run precise tools check and this, this will do some first very primitive uh, structure analysis and will tell you if you have um, typos, if uh, some attribute name is wrong, and uh, it will also check that it can essentially construct this um, visualization that we, that we saw yesterday. So it will check the names of participants, meshes, and data, but it cannot really check the coupling logic in depth. So you may still need to run the simulation to find out about some of these things, some of these problems. Something else that is uh, useful and you saw yesterday in the course is that you can export the coupling mesh and you can visualize it. For a while, uh, this was possible uh, if you added this export VDK in a participant in your configuration. And this would give you the legacy VDK files that are uh, essentially not very different than a CSV file. This has several limitations and is not really supported um, by modern tools. And uh, something that is now much more improved for both serial and parallel participants is that you can uh, have more types of uh, VDK format uh, data. We have uh, modern VDK data types, such as the unstructured grid and the poly data. Finally, mainly because it was easy, maybe you find a use case for that, uh, we also added an export for CSV. Since then, you can do any kind of processing in Pandas or in any other tool you may want. Finally, yesterday you also saw how to configure the logger of Precise. And some of you had the problem that you were installing the Debian package, and that was built in release mode, and it did not have debug messages. However, now we have added a new uh, option that when you build Precise, you can still build it in release mode, but enable uh, debug messages. This will be a bit slower, but not as slow as a debug build. So this is a nice 
uh, trade-off that you, you may want to, to take, at least for, for your laptop. Coming to more um, unique features, there is a new mapping feature, uh, which is called linear cell interpolation. And uh, that was the result of uh, Boris Martin thesis. And um, this is essentially uh, what you get if you uh, mix nearest projection mapping and volume coupling. Nearest projection mapping is the mapping that you can get when you know more uh, about your mesh than the nodes. You know how they are connected, so you can interpolate on the edges. And volume coupling, we mean uh, overlapping domains, both in 2D and in 3D. Now, what the linear cell interpolation does is that it projects onto the cell itself, either a 2D or a 3D, and then it uh, interpolates based on the tetrahedra that you have defined there. Here you see one new tutorial we have that demonstrates this feature. This is called um, channel transport with chemical reaction. And what you have here is uh, two channel flows around the cylinder, and you have two species, uh, compound A, compound B. You just leave them at uh, one initial position, and uh, in the end, you get a reaction that takes both into account. How does this work? Very similarly to every other mapping, you define your participants, and in one of them, you can, or, or both of them, you can define uh, the linear cell interpolation that, of course, has a direction and from to a two. And I think it's um, possible both in consistent and conservative uh, manner. Another feature that uh, is actually older but was not uh, really demonstrated is the direct mesh access. And can somebody tell me what is different in this configuration than what you have seen yesterday? So something that is missing is the mapping. You see, uh, you have two participants. There is no other participant in the simulation. Uh, they both use meshes. They write and read data. But normally, you would expect some mapping from the Dirichlet mesh to the Neumann mesh. However, instead of that, you have an additional tag that is called direct access, an additional attribute. Now, what this allows to, to do is that when you have, for example, conforming meshes, you have the same number of uh, points, you can just access a mesh you receive and, um, and directly use uh, the data without any mapping or with defining your own mapping. But then, of course, you need to know something about the other mesh. You break the black box uh, assumption. To use that feature, this is just uh, a small snippet of the code that you would need to add in your adapter. There are uh, more things involved. Similar to, similarly to how you would get a mesh ID for, um, similar to how you would uh, set uh, mesh vertices and you would um, do that for a mesh that you provide as a participant, you can now directly get a mesh ID for a received mesh. And you can do the same for data you want to write on that. And then you can set a region on that mesh that you want to access. In this case, uh, we have defined a bounding box just by defining a beginning and an end. This is not shown here. That we want to be accessing. So all the nodes in that region we will be able to write to. And uh, later on, we can um, 
get to know who these uh, vertices are and eventually write data to them. Now, this was there since precise version 2.3. That's actually last year's news. But what is now news is that uh, we have a tutorial demonstrating that. And please uh, ask David for, for more details. This is the partition heat conduction. We have essentially uh, um, just um, a heat conduction problem on a plate. We cut it in the middle, and since we have the same number of points, we can directly use the received um, mesh without doing a mapping. Then, something you uh, should start using later on, especially as we go now to a new breaking release, is version macros that you can put in your adapter to enable or disable features depending on the precise version, or to change how you call some methods depending on the version. This way, you could um, allow, for example, your adapter to work both with uh, version 2 and version 3, even though that would be a bit complicated. And uh, you may, for example, uh, only enable this linear cell interpolation where you need to set mesh tetrahedra um, only if you have uh, a version greater than or equal 2.5. And in my opinion, these are the most important user-facing changes in precise version 2.4 and 2.5. There are many things happening under the hood and a lot changing in version 3. Let's now talk about uh, the rest of the components of the ecosystem. Who of you already knows about the precise distribution? Who has heard what this is? Who can explain essentially what that is? Okay, not many people. If you have ever tried to install all the dependencies to start a tutorial or to start using Precise in your own research, you may have noticed, especially in the past, that we tell you, oh, but you need to use that version of that component with that version of that uh, other component and that version of Precise. Since we have multiple repositories and multiple sub-projects, it is a bit difficult to guarantee that uh, everything will work together. So the solution that we came up to that problem was defining a list of uh, versions that are known to work together. This is very similar to how your Linux distribution um, makes a new release. It, at least if it's not a rolling release, it freezes a specific version set um, they also define them in a machine-readable way. This is, this is something we are currently missing. And you know that um, if, you, if you install the latest uh, Firefox, it will work with um, yeah, the, the libc that you may have installed on your system anyway. So that was one of the problems the, of making sure that people install a stack that, comes, um, th that works together. Another problem was uh, how to give you something in this training talks that works. And how we solve it is that we take this distribution and then we create a virtual machine that uh, we give to you. So the virtual machine typically corresponds to some uh, precise distribution version. Finally, we have an additional problem that is, how do we ensure reproducibility of any research we publish? And uh, how do we give credit to people that have worked uh, with Precise, with contributing to Precise in the past um, months or years, but they have not uh, appeared in some paper as authors? So the solution is that we take this uh, data, this code, if you see code as data, and we publish it in a 
data repository on uh, the Dataverse instance of the University of Stuttgart, which is called Darus. In the end, we are able to also get a document identifier, so a DOI, and this is actually the one for the previous version, for the latest one, um, we, we still need to do the process. And this is useful because when you uh, run your simulation with uh, some versions that are in this precise distribution, you can then go to your paper and say, to reproduce the results, um, use this precise distribution. This is something you can cite. And this is uh, particularly helpful. Now, in this distribution that we had in November, and is what is included in the VM that you uh, now downloaded, uh, there are a few uh, new, version, new versions. I think the most important, uh, the most interesting for you maybe, uh, would be that we have um, a new version of the OpenFOAM adapter. This is just a feature version that uh, supports more solvers and features. I will talk about some of this uh, in a moment. We have uh, resolved many issues in the Calculix adapter, again, thanks to Boris. And uh, we updated it to, I think, the latest version now of Calculix, uh, version 2.20. And uh, we have the Phoenix adapter 1.4, uh, that also allows to uh, specify mesh connectivities for nearest projection mapping. We also had some updates in the DL2 adapter and in further components. You see that some of the components have not changed since the previous distribution. This is either because there is not so much to do in them or because we don't really have someone with the expertise to maintain these components. And if you see a component that stays stagnant for a while, this should be uh, the perfect opportunity for you to contribute if you can. Something that um, is included now for the first time in this distribution, we had this div under development for a while, but now it's released as actually a version three because we, we had some versioning before is uh, the Artificial Solver Testing Environment, ASTE. This is uh, a tool that lets you imitate a precise partition participant. Mainly, uh, you need these two tools that are uh, included when you, when you install ASTE as binaries, the precise ASTE run and the precise ASTE evaluate. The precise ASTE run can, for example, replay data that you recorded in a previous simulation so that you don't have to run the simulation again to test the adapter you develop. You just feed, in, feed it in with uh, data per time. And using the precise as to evaluate, you can check the accuracy of the mapping methods you are using. And you can also see, uh, ah, maybe I need a finer mesh in that region or so. Good news are that you will hear more about this on Thursday uh, in the new part of our training course. And there you will see both aspects of replaying and um, accuracy. And the way this works is that similarly to every other adapter that you're writing that may have some configuration file, you need to write a simple configuration file for ASTE that, again, knows which participant it is imitating, uh, what time does it start from, and uh, what meshes does it uh, um, reproduce. There you can uh, point it to specific uh, output VTK files that we have uh, created in a previous simulation and uh, write some data. Of course, it will also need the central configuration file of uh, Precise. Finally, apart from the training course, uh, we have the results from our latest uh, version two paper that also demonstrates the accuracy of the mappings as a tutorial. So 
there what we are doing is that we get two meshes of a wind turbine blade and uh, we evaluate some function and see uh, how it is mapped on the output mesh. And then we compare the accuracy. Another component that uh, uh, was there also last year, but it's now in a much better shape, is the Julia bindings. Is anybody of you using Julia for any application? One person already. Uh, this is uh, one of the upcoming languages that you may keep hearing about. If you write a solver in Julia, Precise will support it. So that's good to know. They are now in better shape and you can also install them from the package manager of Julia, which makes everything uh, much easier. And uh, many people have been involved. Uh, today, later, you will also meet uh, Eric, who uh, can tell you a lot more about this. Some changes in the uh, open form adapter. First of all, uh, with changes in the adapter and with updates in solids for foam, the open form adapter now works with solid solvers from solids for foam which enables a whole new set of possibilities. And as an additional uh, feature that is not uh, shown here because it was not uh, a change in the adapter, with changes in solids for foam, you can now use the RBF mesh motion solver provided by uh, solids for foam to have a smoother mesh motion in your FSI simulations. There is already a tutorial, at least for uh, the solid solver. And uh, you find this in the perpendicular flap as uh, one new participant for the solids for foam. And actually, another one very simple uh, on using the default uh, solid foam participant of open foam, which is not uh, so well known, but is also a very, very simple structure solver. There are further tutorials that you will see that we uh, have now added. One simple example that people were always asking, but um, yeah, um, it's not so complicated, was a very simple heat exchanger. This is, uh, if you see only these two, this is the flow over heated plate tutorial. And uh, the question is, okay, what happens if you add another fluid participant on the bottom? Then you get a heat exchanger. And the solid is uh, in Calculix. That is also something we did not have before. As a tutorial, you now can do have a template to start from for a heat transfer case in Calculix. And uh, in contrast to what we already had as a heat exchanger tutorial. Uh, this is much easier to, to run because the mesh is much coarser. It uses a multi-implicit coupling scheme with three participants instead of um, composing two serial explicit schemes. And uh, it is a transient simulation instead of a, a stationary one. You may have also heard that for a while that Precise can be used for volume coupling, but uh, it is not currently the, the ideal solution for such a simulation. However, as I already explained with a linear cell interpolation, there is a lot of work happening in that area. And there is now also a tutorial that you can run to check it for yourself. This is called the channel transport. And what you have is a channel that has some obstacle in between. And this is uh, currently in uh, Nutils. This is one of the finite element frameworks. This is a fluid code implemented in that. And there is uh, an additional code that only solves a transport problem. Again, in Nutils, we start with some blob of data 
could be something similar to temperature or to uh, a chemical species that is then uh, receiving the, uh, the velocity from the flow solver and it is then um, transporting the blob in the domain. So you will see that it starts like this and then flows out. And we call this a volume coupling because we're not only coupling on one boundary, but we are overlapping the complete domain. Finally, uh, another tutorial that um, you may have seen in papers so far, mostly by uh, Benjamin Rodenberg, who, ah, yes, uh, who is there, is the partitioned oscillator uh, example. So you have two masses uh, connected with springs. And this is very helpful to, to study uh, different time integration schemes. So far for new tutorials, uh, there were also a few new tutorial cases. And one I would like to mention today, also because uh, the contributor is here, is uh, that we have a Dune Femme case for the perpendicular, for the flow over heated plate. And for those of you that um, may have already heard something similar for the perpendicular flap, this is for the Dune Femme and not for the um, general Dune uh, <laughs> solver. The, the naming is a bit confusing there. So far for already released aspects in, uh, uh, in the precise ecosystem, but there are also many things that are almost ready to, to get shipped. We wanted to make some of this before the workshop, but yeah, you, you know how it gets. We are not as many people as you could imagine to handle everything. One uh, piece of important news is that uh, we had started already uh, coupling uh, open foam fluid solvers, but we had some issues and now these issues are resolved. So uh, as part of uh, uh, the master's thesis of my student Markus Mulhoise, who uh, is scheduled to, to have a talk tomorrow. Um, we discovered several improvements we can make, both in the adapter and in the cases. And uh, we now have, we will have soon um, custom inlet outlet boundary conditions for um, uh, fluid fluid coupling. And that was quite an interesting um, investigation finding out um, assumptions that OpenFoam takes and automatic adjustments it does that uh, may be a bit um, yeah, difficult to, to predict. Something else that uh, we are working and it's uh, about to get released is uh, volume coupling support for OpenFoam, which would then uh, come with an additional tutorial case for the channel transport I just showed you for OpenFoam is uh, volume coupling. Several people have uh, worked on this in the past, including Prasad. And um, now we are looking into all the approaches that people have uh, taken in the past and trying to release an official, um, an official feature for the open form adapter so that people can use the official adapter instead of um, trying to integrate um, extensions from the, from the community. As I said, this, uh, this will come as a tutorial as well, and uh, this is part of the interdisciplinary project of uh, my student, Tina Vladimirova. Uh, sometimes there are nice uh, contributions by the community that come out of the blue, and we were particularly happy this year to uh, find out that um, um, someone that I don't know how, how to thank, um, has uh, now updated our SU2 adapter from version 6 that was stale for a while to the latest version, 7.5. And there has been a lot of work. Uh, it's uh, being actively uh, reviewed, uh, uh, actively <laughs> uh, contributed by him. And uh, we have done um, 
at least the first iteration of review, and this will continue as soon as possible. So apart from OpenFoam, you will also have another solver that is um, widely used and up-to-date. A new tutorial that uh, uh, is part of uh, Kyle's uh, PhD is uh, an FSI with, um, uh, with a two-phase flow. So you may know already about this breaking dumb example. And uh, the question is, okay, can this also work with uh, fluid structure interaction? What happens when the, the dumb, is the, when, the, um, when the pillar you have in the middle is uh, flexible? And we'll have this not only in 2D, but also in 3D, where you'll have uh, three, uh, two piles of water uh, collapsing and hitting a central uh, flexible beam. And uh, we, we are confident that we will publish this because uh, Cal has already published this in his PhD. Another feature that is part of uh, my research, but is uh, going rather slowly, is the geometric multiscale, which means that you will soon be able to, <laughs> at least for simple simulations, um, couple participants that are of different dimensions. Yesterday, someone asked, ah, but this uh, um, generated propagator example we had was uh, just exchanging scalars and just 1D, essentially, why do we need to define it as 2D? Uh, the two solvers are essentially of different dimensions, but the generator is also defined as a 2D. Well, soon you will not need to make such assumptions, but you will be able to say that each participant has a different um, uh, number of dimensions and how you should essentially map from the one domain to the other. Uh, there I'm working uh, with a student, Elia Zonta, into pushing this forward. Other big features that are coming, uh, one is the coupling of macro and micro simulations. And you may have heard about a micro manager. This is not um, really someone micromanaging uh, someone's work, but it's a piece of software starting and stopping uh, micro simulations of a macroscopic problem. And this is something that uh, Ishan will talk about uh, later today. Good news is that um, this is very actively developed and there are also uh, 0.x uh, releases already. Another large feature that is coming uh, is uh, much, much faster uh, radial basis function mapping. And uh, this is uh, implementing a partition of Unity concept, and David will talk about it uh, later today. So much for code and uh, yeah, features that are a bit difficult to digest. Let's uh, uh, look at some updates regarding the community. First of all, uh, who, who of you has not yet used our forum. Okay, so it's it's a great place to to search and a great place to ask questions, and now it's also a great place to post uh, job and uh, thesis uh, announcements. For example, here we have uh, many students asking for thesis, but uh, we cannot supervise all of them. And at some point, I was. Um, uh, asked by someone on LinkedIn, hey, we're looking for someone working on a project using Precise. Would you be interested? And then I said, mm, not, not really at the moment, but uh, I could post it on the forum. And uh, then also uh, Miriam said, okay, uh, we are looking for people in Stuttgart. Maybe you can help spread the word. So please, if you're interested, or you know someone that would be interesting, interested and interesting, please forward them to, to Miriam. You can also post uh, related things there as well. Something else that is not so new, 
but it looks like people don't know it about it, and I was discussing with uh, Prasad about it yesterday, is the category community projects in the forum. And this is the place where you can put uh, cases we have prepared that are not really suitable for a precise tutorial, meaning that uh, they are not that easy and fast to run, and maybe they rely on some more complex uh, meshes or some codes that are not publicly available. That could be a place to describe and archive your case files. And a further reminder, if you go to the website, to the community section, there is uh, a page called Stories. There, you will find examples of uh, what many users have done with Precise. And this is very important for uh, several people and several reasons. It is uh, important for us to show what people are doing with Precise. It is important for you to showcase your research and also get feedback. And it is also a very nice example of um, what different applications people have worked on and maybe who you could contact if you want to uh, simulate a similar application. Contributing to that is super easy and people overthink it much more than they should. So you can either send us an email with a short text and essentially a very rough picture of the application. This does not need to show the perfect results or something. It's meant to be as a, as a guidance for people that uh, want to decide if they want to contact you, maybe or not. And uh, if you don't like emails, you can also just contribute directly on the website. You can click the edit button and add a new file um, with the details as a pull request. Another reminder that uh, is mostly news from, from last year, but it is still uh, very relevant and it's increasing, is a possibility we uh, have now to actually uh, closely work with us. The concept is that Precise is an open source tool and um, you, you need support and we try to, to help everyone and we will keep helping everyone publicly on the, on the forum. But sometimes you just need um, a closer look into something and uh, someone to, to have meetings with. At the same time, we are um, only getting funding to develop new features and rarely to maintain what we already have. This is a very common issue in research software engineering. Uh, people develop software that is crucial to do research, but um, essentially after the software is considered as completed, uh, there is no funding to further maintain it. Okay, so the way this uh, works is that you can get a support license um, for Precise, which uh, um, is also uh, attractive both for academic and industrial users. Of course, much cheaper for academia, and it depends on, on its case, on what you need. And including this in your research proposal, for example, for uh, DFG, the, the German uh, research um, uh, funding, you would um, also increase the success rate of your application because you can show that um, you have someone to talk to regarding the coupling. You're not just going in the dark. You will have um, more safety uh, anchors. We will um, also try to help you first in the forum, again publicly. Uh, at the moment, yeah, I, I think you 
you see some of us um, helping there a lot, but it's uh, taking a lot of time. And it would be good to, to know that, okay, uh, with limited time, we could prioritize some of the threads. And uh, if you like the course, you could also um, arrange that uh, we offer the same in your university, in your company, in a larger scale, and uh, tailor to exactly what you need. On further news, um, last year we had started the publication process of um, the precise version 2 paper. Uh, originally that was on uh, archive, and then there was uh, um, a first version on the Open Research Europe that still needed to go through the open review process. This, this was really nice. And uh, now this is completely rock solid, at least in terms of the, of the reviews. It, it's already the, the second revision. And please, please, please uh, cite this. If you're using Precise nowadays, you're using Precise version 2, not version 1. You, you can cite still the version 1 if you want to refer to the concepts from there or to related feature papers. Um, yeah, but um, uh, also, um, yeah, many, many of the concepts have, have changed. This you can find on the landing page of the, of the website. And if you click in the literature guide, you will um, go to an updated page where we also explain uh, what to cite when. As a summary, um, if you are talking or using, if you're talking about or using Precise, you probably want to cite the version 2 paper. And the name is a bit unfortunate because um, we don't really plan to have a new paper for every version. This will show how it goes. <laughs> um, then uh, there are feature-specific papers. For example, if you want to use the waveform iteration, there is also a paper printed uh, outside. We have, uh, or we try to have adapter papers. There is also the Phoenix Precise paper um, printed outside. And then there is also the precise distribution that I explained earlier on. And this is particularly helpful uh, when you want to, um, to cite data for reproducibility. Um, then, and since um, uh, many of you here are uh, OpenFOAM users, um, maybe you don't yet know about the, the OpenFOAM journal, but it would be a very good um, place to, to publish uh, related research. And um, if you are uh, doing, uh, if you're writing to us uh, in the chat room we have on Gitter, um, you may notice uh, from yesterday that if you try to log in, uh, it tells you to uh, log into a new system. Uh, this is because Gitter uh, is uh, merging essentially with Matrix. There is no Gitter anymore, but uh, there is a new server for Matrix, which is actually a good thing, uh, but will be confusing for a bit in the beginning. And as a reminder, you can also find us there, but preferably write on the forum because that's something we can uh, easily uh, refer people to. Since uh, um, we really try to spread the word about uh, the workshop and other news we have, and you may want to keep learning news, um, we yeah, we try to have some presence in social media. This is very exhausting sometimes. And now there is even more. Uh, but if you are on Mastodon, you can also find Precise there on Fostodon. And if you uh, like this workshop and you want to meet um, many of these people again, first, come again to the, to the next uh, Precise workshop, uh, probably next year, let's see. Um, but you could also come uh, this summer to the ECOMAS uh, Couple Problems. Uh, this is uh, actually on the island I come from, 
which is uh, really fortunate to, to finally uh, go home for a conference. And uh, we are organizing a mini symposium um, there to which you can still contribute talks and potentially contribute a paper. And um, I think it's um, safe to say that we already have uh, enough content for at least uh, three sessions. Slowly wrapping up, um, don't miss later today and tomorrow further developer talks on the macro microcoupling by Ishan, on data mapping by David, time interpolation by Benny, and the upcoming changes in precise version 3 by Frederick. And please think of uh, what you are um, learning from these uh, talks. We really want to hear your feedback, and the best place would be the World Cafe uh, tomorrow. As a last slide, and this is repeating my slide from last year, many of the names are were in my presentation this year. Let's see if uh, you can get your name in our presentation next year. All right, thank you very much, and uh, I'm a bit early, but this gives us more time for questions. And for that, I would also like uh, at least Benjamin and whoever else from the team wants to, uh, to join to also uh, yeah, come or uh, be available. Thank you. Do you have questions already? Yes. Yes, so the idea is that um, uh, this will be integrated in the adapter. It's not yet there, it's a, it's a pull request. And uh, comments would be very nice actually there. So we currently implement it in the same um, field specific way. We are implementing everything. This is um, a decision we need to revisit. But essentially, you can say that for the complete field or for a set of cells with the cell set, uh, I want to extract, uh, for example, the, the velocity. And this works uh, using exactly the same uh, of the rest of the code. So this is just the cell centers of the, of the field. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, I think p partially that's an open issue. <laughs> but uh, what kind of dependencies do you mean? Dependencies of the packages listing, listed here or dependencies of those packages? Yeah, so uh, an assumption here is um, that uh, each of these packages working with their dependencies, and um, so far we did not have conflicts between those. And um, the reproducible um, aspect comes with also the virtual machine that already has its own dependencies installed. So, so far this is Ubuntu 20.04, uh, this we will need to, to upgrade eventually. And um, uh, that release also has OpenFOAM uh, v2206. And if you even want to go one step further, so in Stuttgart we currently have a student thesis that works on um, converting the distribution to um, Nix OS. And then uh, you even have like a, a complete frozen state of all the dependencies of the, of the OS, right? So in the virtual machine, 
if you really look at the details, it's not reproducible because the dependencies of the of the US change, right? But if you update, yeah, if you update. <laughs> <laughs> but with NixOS, you could also kind of uh, freeze that. So mm -hmm. we are um, we are not yet sure where this goes. We just wanna wanted to give it a try and see what we can learn. Another uh, potential there, similar to to the NixOS, would be um, using the Spark Package Manager if we had. Uh, Spark packages for everything, which we currently don't. Uh, but this is also not super difficult to get. We, it's just not a priority. How we would map the packages in? I guess the basically the question is mainly how to use spec on a supercomputer. Right. Um, I'm a bit confused with the admin rights to use spec because um, uh, spec is designed so that you don't uh, have to use, you don't have to have admin rights. Um, you can build everything in a local directory in your user um, uh, path. Perfect. And Precise is already installed on some supercomputers via the XSDK framework uh, that Frederick can tell you more about. You want to mention more, Frederick? Yeah. Uh, so regarding Spuck, uh, this is like an, an user, um, a user tool. You don't need uh, sudo access or admin access for that. I don't know who I should uh, be looking at now, but anyhow. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, the question was if uh, you can also run Precise in a container. Of course we can. And you can also run it uh, in uh, um, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, and uh, for Singularity, or now called Obtainer, um, I don't have a particular idea, but I think uh, two years ago we had um, a presentation from LRZ uh, using it with uh, Charlie Cloud, which I think was uh, a similar, a, a solution trying to solve a similar problem. Um, the only thing that you need to know is that you cannot simply um, run the two participants in different uh, containers, or one in a container and one on your system. For example, if you install OpenFoam as a Docker container, uh, you cannot just um, couple it with something installed locally on your system. If you uh, run both in containers with Docker, you can use, for example, Docker Compose to make the two containers talk to each other. Because in the end, uh, what uh, Precise does to let the participants communicate is that it opens a network socket, at least if you don't use MPI ports. And this is something that we are now using for um, our new system tests. Yeah, I think maybe good to mention. So we, we use Docker a lot for our uh, continuous integration. So you will find um, older um, uh, Docker images on, on Docker Hub and also some now on the uh, GitHub registry. Um, but typically we do not recommend those uh, for users. So we mainly use them for our testing. Um, I think as a user there are other ways that we rec would recommend how to use it. But of course, the packages, the images are there. You can use them. Yeah. It's kind of our public uh, uh, dirty scratch uh, <laughs> directory. So yeah, so some, some of the things uh, will work for you, but most of them will not. So we don't guarantee anything there. Yes.
So the question was, um, can I run my fluid simulation on a supercomputer and a structure simulation on my laptop? Um, this question can also be generalized. Can you run the two participants into different systems? And this has not only HPC-related aspects, but also licensing aspects. We had uh, a discussion with uh, some colleagues at TUM that they had a license for a particular computer for a solver and a license for a particular computer for another solver, both proprietary solvers. And then how do you connect them? Um, there are different approaches there. Um, in principle, it is possible, but you will have to fight a lot with the firewall of the computers. Uh, because in the end, you need to make sure that this network connection can be established between the two uh, participants. Sometimes you can, um, you need to think, okay, I have um, only read or write access to, to one of the two. And maybe you could even think of a solution that you have a, a wrapper um, that is, in the end, just exchanging some data, but then this uh, destroys the whole concept of uh, efficient communication. Yeah. So, in principle, um, it is possible, but you need to be good friends with the admin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or be the admin. Yeah. Be the admin, yeah. For the moment, not. Um, I wanted to point out something. Mm -hmm. Are we already on the correct slide? Um, so, s some small detail that uh, maybe you saw on the very uh, right bottom corner. Um, there is also a, uh, a PDF of the documentation. Um, so, we uh, documentation is on the website, but there might be reasons why you uh, prefer a PDF because you have no internet connection. Um, so, um, you also convert the complete website into a PDF. Um, that you can find here. And this is also an option if you're looking for an older documentation. So if you're still working with an older precise version and um, things have changed drastically and you want to check how was the documentation maybe different before, um, you can look up the PDFs here. <laughs> can I ask a question and answer it myself? Yes. <laughs> uh, th there are so many nice tools usually uh, written in Python that have, uh, in the documentation, they have a menu for a version uh, selection. Uh, this would be very nice. Why don't we have that? Well, the answer is that, unfortunately, we are not using um, the same documentation framework, and this is complicated. Uh, we would love to do that, uh, but since we have limited resources, we also try to, to always keep the latest um, version there. This is also some motivation for you to update. Please do update. We try to keep some of the information accessible, but it's very difficult to give support for older versions because that's not the versions that we're running. Yeah, should we do a quick survey? Who runs the oldest precise version? <laughs> Still somebody running precise version one? The camera is not pointing at you, don't worry. <laughs> 2.0, 2.1, <laughs> 2.2, 2.3. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please, please update. <laughs> Excellent topic for the user support sessions. Yes. Uh, we um, really we invest a lot of time to make everything as backwards compatible as possible. Um, we are only breaking things like every three years, uh, roughly. Um, so it should be very easy to update and things should only get better, not mm -hmm. worse. <laughs> I think it would also be uh, important to mention something about uh, the versioning systems we have. So we, at least for the library, we try to stick to semantic versioning, um, which means that version two to version three will have breaking changes. So code compiled for precise version two will not run with precise version three, and code compiled for version three will not run with version two. Um, but whenever you see 
For example, 2.4 to 2.5, this is an update that at least we try to guarantee that you will, can do without any changes in your code. Uh, in principle, you should not even need to recompile your code, only relink it to the latest library. So don't be afraid to update to versions that are in the same uh, major version. And, and no updates to your config files are necessary. Yeah. So you should just be able to run your um, with the same precise config mm -hmm. as before. This had been ugly in version one, but I think we did a good job in version two. I guess questions are saturated for the moment. Let's get some fresh air and uh, maybe in five minutes come back for the intro. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So let's, yeah, at half past, let's do the intro and let's open the windows for the moment. Yeah.